Why is Palpatine a bad guy, one of the most beloved characters in all of Star Wars? It's not because he could suck the souls out of other Force users or take out an entire enemy fleet with Sith lightning. It was really never about his Force powers or his fighting abilities or even how evil he could get. No, what makes Senator, Chancellor, Emperor Palpatine so intriguing is that most of his victories were actually achieved in the political realm through subtle planning and gamesmanship. While Sith before Darth Sidious and Plagueis had achieved success against the Republic, usually by starting open conflicts, Palpatine alone decided to learn more about the political culture of the Republic. He came to a realization that the Republic's political and economic system were amongst the most robust in galactic history. The Republic codified and created a sense of order around how governance and business was supposed to be handled. The Republic created a stable society. Paired with a free market, we saw one of the most advanced and rapidly growing societies in all of galactic history. There is simply no other force that could stand against it, not even the Sith Empire. And so Palpatine, instead of trying to destroy the system like so many other Sith did in years past, began to study it, find out how it actually worked. And after many years with the help of his mentor Darth Plagueis, Palpatine would become one of the slickest operators in the Galactic Senate and in all of Republic politics. He was well posed to make his bid for the Chancellorship. Today we're going to be taking a closer look at Sheev Palpatine's most brilliant political maneuvers, which got him exactly where he needed to be without raising any suspicion. Now, speaking of brilliant, let's talk about today's sponsor, Brilliant. Sponsorships like this allow us to keep our channel afloat and also presents us a unique opportunity to talk about products and subjects we usually don't get to talk about. In this case, we have this app, Brilliant. It's designed to train people in the foundations of STEM. What sets it apart from other learning tools is that it uses its own style of interactive and intuitive problem solving scenarios, which are both fun and engaging to do. And that means a lot coming from me because I dislike school a lot. I mean, like I wanted to enter the workforce at the age of 14, but this course is really well done and it actually does keep my interest, which is surprising. Brilliant does a great job of simplifying very complex ideas into small and digestible lessons that not only teach you how to do things, but also walks you through the steps yourself and helps you repeat those actions over and over again so that they become deeply ingrained. Brilliant is clearly tuned into the latest in education theory, which is fitting because they're also teaching STEM here. Brilliant's course list goes through a wide range of different subjects ranging from basic algebra to understanding what exactly cryptocurrency or quantum computing is all about. Education, it's the best gift you can give to your family, to your friends, and to yourself. If this sounds like something you guys might be interested in, the first 200 people who use our link in the description down below, brilliant.org slash generation tech, will get 20% off of an annual subscription. Before Queen Amidala, before Senator Palpatine, Naboo was just another backwards mid-rim world, heavy on culture and tradition, but light on economic development and connection to the outer world. The population on the planet was also pretty small, if you didn't count the Gungans, of course, who hid in swamps and in underwater cities. The planet reached a crossroad a few decades before the Clone Wars engulfed the entire galaxy. You see, a large plasma deposit had been found beneath the planet's surface. Apparently, Naboo's plasma was extremely pure and burned very clean, making it very in demand as a fuel source. The only problem was that Naboo lacked the technological know-how and resources to build a large enough refining operation to produce fuel at big enough of a scale to allow Naboo plasma to be competitively priced. We did a whole video about this, by the way, and talked about how resource-rich planets without the internal means to develop those resources oftentimes find themselves in a tricky situation and being exploited by large corporations or other nations that do have that technology to exploit those resources. Now, as a young man, Palpatine grew up on Naboo and he hated the fact that his planet was so politically and economically backwards. I mean, his own father was actually a member of an isolationist political party. And so Palpatine set in motion a series of actions that would not only secure Naboo's economic and political future, but also his own. It was actually a really smart move. Young Palpatine would back one of the presidential candidates, Bon Topolo, for king of Naboo. Topolo was open to foreign investments. He would invite the Trade Federation onto the planet and have them develop Naboo's natural plasma resources, for a hefty percentage, of course. The Trade Federation would not only build refineries and mines and other facilities involved in plasma extraction, they would also upgrade the planetary spaceports and other infrastructure so that it could accommodate larger freighters that could ship Naboo's plasma to the export market. 
market. While there was some growth and some wealth connected to this project, it was mostly given to those who were directly related to the plasma extraction industry, which was only a handful of people on the planet. Naboo didn't turn into a thriving Usaminopolis overnight, but what it did have now was a corporate sponsor, the Trade Federation, and it had its hooks deeply anchored onto the planet. And so when Prop 31814D was passed, basically allowing the Outer Rim to be taxed once again, this is where the uh, Trade Federation had most of their resources and operations located, in retaliation, the Trade Federation would blockade Naboo. Now, there's another part of the story that most people don't know. The Trade Federation had always belonged to a group of powerful businesses and political entities being groomed by Darth Plagueis for his eventual takeover of the galaxy. The Trade Federation invasion in Naboo was actually carefully being guided by Darth Sidious, who wanted to use the attack to destabilize the Republic, potentially kill a few Jedi, you know, the usual chaos that the Sith of his era liked causing from the shadows. What was unexpected, though, was Palpatine's second part of the plan. You see, he understood that the Republic Senate was just a bureaucratic mess. Everything was gridlocked because of procedure and paperwork and all of these different special interests. And so when he convinced Padme Amidala to ask the Republic to intervene to save her people from the Trade Federation, he basically foresaw what would happen. All Chancellor Valorum could offer to Padme was a subcommittee that would first see if her allegations were true before they even discussed what to do about it. Enter the bureaucrats, the true rulers of the Republic. This is where Chancellor Valorum's strength will disappear. I mean, Palpatine doesn't really have to whisper much into young Padme's ears here. Yes, she is inexperienced in the political world, but, you know, she's pretty strong and independent-minded, and if, uh, you know, Chancellor Valorum isn't going to help out her people, then she'll find someone else who will. This body is not capable of action. I suggest new leadership is needed. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. Which is perfect timing for Palpatine, who had been slowly building up his political career over the years. He had made a lot of friends and he stepped on very few toes. And so with the support of his master, Palpatine would easily be elected as Chancellor of the Republic. Very well played, Palpatine. Very well played. More than a decade later, Chancellor Palpatine would be facing down the Separatist crisis. It was a self-manufactured crisis. The CIS was actually controlled opposition and being led by Count Dooku, aka Darth Tyrannus, the apprentice of Sidious. Palpatine, facing the prospect of war, used a very similar tactic to the one that he used on Naboo. In a meeting with several senators who were very close to him, Palpatine implants the idea of what must be done in order for the Republic to be safe. The Senate will never approve the use of clones before the Separatists attack. Which of course means that... This is a crisis. The Senate must vote the Chancellor emergency powers. He can then approve the creation of an army. If only Senator Amidala were here. Senator Amidala wasn't there because she and Anakin were hiding from assassins, and so it was actually Jar Jar Binks, the junior senator from Naboo, who had to step up and take the lead. Or at least that is what Palpatine is leading poor Jar Jar Binks to, and moments later in a Senate session, we're treated to this scene here. Misa proposed that the Senate give immediately emergency powers to the Supreme Chancellor. And the rest is history. Again, well played. One of the stranger things about the Galactic Republic was its complete lack of a federal banking system. Everything from the printing of new credits to interest rates were actually set by the Intergalactic Banking Clan, a privately held banking group. They were supposed to be neutral, they were supposed to be an apolitical organization, and they were supposed to be safe and secure. The entire galaxy's economic system depended on the IGBC to operate smoothly and keep the credits flowing. The thing is, a leader without a central bank is missing a very powerful set of tools that allow him to affect how fast or how slow his economy is growing. Palpatine wanted to create a massive military industrial complex that could fuel and sustain a military force even larger than the Grand Army of the Republic. And so Palpatine sought to control the IGBC and turn it into a federal bank so that he could basically print his own credits and fund whatever he wants to fund. But in order to do this, he first must destabilize the IGBC. 
First, it was uncovered that the IGBC was almost insolvent. Apparently, the core five who ran the bank had given out several large loans to the Separatist Alliance sans interest. Once this was revealed, Senator Rush Clovis would be assigned to oversee the banks and bring them back into compliance and essentially save the galaxy's financial system. But Palpatine would have Count Dooku pressure Clovis into giving the Republic a much higher borrowing rate than the CIS. On top of that, a small skirmish would erupt on the planet of Scipio, where the IGBC was headquartered, creating even more instability. This is the last straw, basically. Confidence in the IGBC and Republic economy and financial system were severely shaken by these incidents. And shortly after, the IGBC voluntarily gave up all control of their assets to Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. And yes, in case you're wondering, the IGBC has some very deep connections to the Sith. The final stroke of Palpatine's political genius would destroy a ancient enemy of the Sith, the Jedi Order. For thousands of years since the first Dark Jedi were exiled and kicked off of Coruscant, the Sith have been plotting their revenge. The Sith would try to use anything and everything at their disposal to destroy the Republic. They would use proxy forces like the Mandalorians to see chaos. They would turn fallen Jedi like Revan against their own people and discredit the Jedi name. But at the end of the day, the Sith really lacked two things, resources and manpower. And whenever they did achieve success in one of their wars, in those short moments of relative peace, the Sith would just begin to fight amongst each other and tear each other apart. The rule of two Sith would wait quietly in the shadows until Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious engineered the perfect moment for them to take over the galaxy's political system and then turn it against the Jedi. They didn't even have to do any work themselves. It was simply brilliant. Now, how did he do this? Well, first, he entangled the Jedi with the federal military. Shortly after the reveal of the Separatist droid army on Geonosis, the Republic adopted the clone army, which Palpatine asked Yoda and his Jedi to lead. Getting the Jedi to fight in a war was not a very easy thing to do, despite what we all might think. I do have to say, though, if the enemy is the Sith, it was uh, usually pretty easy. A Jedi will curb stomp any Sith they run into, no questions asked. It could be a tiny little girl, it could be a little baby, or an old man, or an old man who looks like a tiny baby but actually is a little girl. And so the appearance of Maul many years earlier, and then the fallen Jedi Dooku at the head of the Separatist Alliance, definitely made Yoda more eager to fight in this war. That was the bait, and the Jedi took it. On top of that, this clone army had been ordered by the, you know, oftentimes troubled, but still very beloved, Jedi Master sifo -Dyas. Many of the council members in the Jedi Order had been friends with sifo -Dyas back when he was alive, and so that puts the Jedi a bit more at ease with their mysterious military force that appeared out of nowhere. There was also very little time for Yoda to think about the situation they were in. Pretty much moments after it was revealed that the Separatists had a giant military force, Yoda and Mace Windu split up and launched an attack in an attempt to end the perceived Sith threat, and also rescue Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin, and Padme. The Jedi dived head into this responsibility without thinking, and they paid the ultimate price for it. Not because the clones had inhibitor chips and would shoot them later on, I mean, that was also clearly a factor, but once the Jedi had become combatants, they didn't really have an easy way of backing out of the war. That would essentially be desertion. They were caught and ensnared in Palpatine's trap. I mean, think about it. If the Jedi did find out about Order 66 in the clones' heads, or if they found out that Palpatine was a Sith, what could they do? Could they really just stop fighting or fight against the clones or fight against Palpatine? They would immediately be seen as enemies of the state. Now, in the last year of the war, things were not going well for the Jedi. They had suffered tremendous casualties, both physically and spiritually. You also had that incident with Clone Trooper Tup executing a Jedi General in the field, and other worrying signs that things were kind of off. The Jedi had become suspicious that Chancellor Palpatine or someone around him was compromised by the Sith. They sent young Anakin Skywalker to spy on his mentor, which of course played right into Palpatine's hands. The Dark Lord had been playing the long game with Anakin and had developed into almost a father-like figure for the young man, which is why Palpatine didn't really hesitate to reveal his dark secret that he in fact was a Dark Lord to Anakin. Palpatine probably knew that Anakin wouldn't kill him. Instead, Anakin goes and tells Mace Windu about what happened. Mace Windu is one of the most direct and, should I say, hot-blooded Jedi Masters in the entire Order. He was very zealous when it came to killing Sith. And so Mace Windu immediately assembles a strike team and visits the Chancellor's office with the intention of arresting him. Now, from our point of view, this all seems legit. Palpatine is very evil. I mean, he destroyed all of Run, but, you know, I guess no one else in the room or in the galaxy knew about that at the time. And so to the average citizen, what this looked like was 
a bunch of holy monks who aren't really elected or have an official part in the government trying to overthrow the government by using a violent coup. I mean, the Jedi didn't go to the judicial department. They didn't go to the Senate and go through the proper procedures of basically accusing Emperor Palpatine of being what? A follower of an ancient forced religion? Is that really grounds? for overthrowing someone? Those were the calculations that Palpatine made in his head and he was right the Jedi look like dickheads for doing this. The attempt on my life has left me scarred and deformed. You see, Palpatine plays the victim here and at the same time he also expresses how he's strong because he survived their assassination attempt. But I assure you, my resolve has never been stronger. He's really an excellent speaker. He's got the crowd right where he wants them. And the remaining Jedi will be hunted down and defeated. And because of that, he'll have achieved something that no other Sith before him is ever able to do, and that is to destroy their hated enemies, the Jedi. The Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic Empire for a safe and secure society. Absolutely masterful. Now, notice how I called this Palpatine's last brilliant political maneuver. I mean, you guys might be asking me, hey, didn't Palpatine rule for another like 20 years as emperor? Yes, he did. And he did not make any brilliant political maneuvers or nothing at the scale of what he did during the Republic era. And that is because once he became emperor, he slowly eroded all of the institutions that were designed to keep him in check, um, like the Imperial Senate, the media. He got rid of critics, military advisors that didn't like what he was doing. And so at the end of it, he didn't have to use politics to do things. He was surrounded by sycophants and individuals who loved everything he said. So he just used military force to get what he wanted. Now, that was very different Palpatine from Palpatine we just talked about here in the prequels. Uh, you know, when Palpatine is still in the Senate and when he's a chancellor, he's still inside of a vibrant republic. And all of those checks and balances, well, they ironically brought out the best of Palpatine and made him an even more conniving politician. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. My name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, the democracy.